Welcome to the Astronomers for Planet Earth webinar series, hosted by Dr. Travis Rector, Professor of Astrophysics at University of Alaska, Anchorage. Today's guest is Dr. J. Marshall Shepard. Dr. Shepard is a leading international expert in weather and climate and is the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Geography and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Georgia. Dr. Shepard was the 2013 president of the American Meteorological Society, AMS, the nation's largest and oldest professional science society in the atmospheric and related sciences. Dr. Shepard serves as director of the University of Georgia's Atmospheric Sciences Program and full professor in the Department of Geography where he was a previous associate department head. Dr. Shepard is also the host of the Weather Channel's award-winning show, Weather Geeks, a pioneering Sunday talk podcast show, and is a contributor to Forbes magazine. Prior to UGA, Dr. Shepard spent 12 years as a research meteorologist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and was deputy project scientist for the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, GPM, a multinational space mission that launched in 2014. Hi everyone, my name is Travis Rector and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And I'm also one of the organizers for a group called Astronomers for Planet Earth. Our group is dedicated to helping professional astronomers, students and educators be more informed about the causes and consequences of climate change, as well as solutions. Uh, we're very privileged today to have our speaker, Dr. Marshall Shepard. Uh, his accolades run long, and I'm not going to be able to go through them all, but he is currently the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Sciences and Geography. He's also the Director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Georgia. He's also a full professor in the Department of Geography and also a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And in 2013, he was the president of the American Meteorological Society. And he also runs a really fantastic blog on Forbes magazine talking about weather and climate change issues. Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Travis. And thank you for sticking with me as we've been trying to get this scheduled. I'm happy to be here talking with uh, fellow scientists. Uh, you know, I, I, I should say, I guess I have some uh, perceived connection to your colleagues as astronomers in that uh, I spent the first 12 years of my career at NASA. And oftentimes people did not really have a sense of why there was a meteorologist or a research meteorologist or a climate scientist working at the nation's space agency. I, were, I spent 12 years at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And so I would get all kinds of interesting questions about things that probably some of you were uh, likely to be able to discuss than me because people just associate NASA with space and astronomy and astrophysics and so forth. But in fact, NASA has a very robust Earth Sciences Division where it's using its resources to look back at planet Earth. And in fact, the image that you see on my opening screen is a satellite image of Hurricane Ida uh, from earlier this summer, 2021, uh, superimposed on the nights at light, uh, at lights at night uh, satellite imagery that uh, NASA satellites and NOAA satellites also can provide. So it's really a juxtaposition of extreme weather and society in that image. And the title of my talk today is Extreme Weather, Climate Change Connections, Perspectives on the Science, Vulnerability, and the Message. And so I hope the things that I talk about today will resonate with you. And I look forward to joining you later for uh, some questions and answers that perhaps uh, come up uh, as I go through this talk. So let's start with the elephant in the room. Uh, I don't think it's an elephant in the room for any of us that understand science and physics. The climate is changing. Uh, the signs of that change are all around us. Uh, greenhouse gases are increasing, and we have known for uh, decades to centuries to some degree about the role that greenhouse gases play uh, in the climate system. Uh, there's natural variability in our climate system, of course. Uh, certainly there are contrarians that will come up to me and say, well, our climate has always changed, Dr. Shepard. Of course it has, but we know that there are 
anthropogenic signals and, and forcings on top of the naturally varying climate in the same way that grass grows naturally in our lawns, but when we fertilize the soil, it grows differently. So it's not either or in terms of natural or anthropogenic, it's and, and I think that's what we're seeing. And our climate is responding to that in terms of the impacts on people, infrastructure, ecosystems, and the economy. And there you see on the top right is the July 2021 uh, atmospheric and land ocean temperature anomalies. And clearly this summer was one of the warmest on record. And that's not really breaking news to me anymore. You know, I, I, I actually somewhat get uh, annoyed when I see headlines that say it was the warmest June on record. It was the warmest summer, summer on record. That's going to be the headline going forward. So that's not breaking news. Uh, you can see in the, uh, the, the distribution functions there, uh, when we see shifted means, increased variability and changes in the symmetry of uh, temperature or precipitation, uh, it changes the extreme weather events on both sides of the ledger. And so that, that's part of what I'll be talking about today. So this, this is a look at the number of 2020 billion dollar weather and climate disasters uh, in the contiguous US. You can see the range of events, hurricanes with a record hurricane season in 2020, tornadoes, drought, wildfires. The, it runs the gamut of extreme events. And that's certainly one thing that we expect to happen uh, in an era of climate uh, change and the extremes. So let's talk about the implications to society. This was a paper that came out last year, it was published by scholars at Columbia University. And one of the things that really grabbed my attention about this particular study is it shows that the temperature, what we call the wet bulb temperature or the wet bulb exceedance, is really a measure of sort of human habitability on the planet. It's a combination of temperature and uh, humidity and some other sort of physical factors associated with our bodies and how it exchanges heat. And this study showed that, that and you see this temp these uh, daily maximum wet bulb temperatures, when you see anything above 30, we need to be concerned. And what this tells us is that we are already exceeding um, maximum wet bulb temperatures for habitability on the planet. Now, we're not exceeding them for sort of long periods of time that make us sort of, that make the planet uh, unlivable at this point, but we are starting to see temperatures in this range in parts of the Mideast, India, even parts of Central and North America, South America, Australia, and Africa. And so the, the alarming thing about this is that climate change we know is ramping up. We're not sort of in an asymptote period. We are still perhaps in a period where we're transitioning from linear to exponential growth in some of the sort of things that we worry about happening. And part of that is because of feedbacks, uh, something called the ice albedo feedback, for example, when we're losing Arctic ice that opens up more warming in the Arctic region, which in turn amplifies the warming. I'm, I'm certain that astronomers are familiar with the concept of feedbacks. And that's why we expect there to be a period of ramping up in, of, of many of the impacts that we are seeing with climate change. So this is worrisome. Uh, this is a, a, an image in New York City earlier this summer as the remnants of Hurricane Ida uh, moved into the Northeast. It made landfall in the Gulf of Mexico, causing all of the problems that you would expect from a Category 4 or major hurricane in terms of storm surge, wind, and rainfall. Uh, but then the remnants of that storm moved into uh, parts of the Northeast, highly populated, heavily populated areas of Philadelphia and New York and so forth, and caused a flood disaster. Uh, many people died. Many of them were living in basement apartments that flooded. Uh, marginalized or poor communities. And so uh, this sets up the contextualization of what I plan to talk about, because what we know is that the DNA of climate change is in today's uh, storms. And it looks like that may have been cut off, but the DNA of climate change is in today's um, hydrometeorological storms. Uh, basic physics, the Clausius-Clapeyron relationship suggests that uh, for every degree of, of warming we see, uh, there will there'll be something on the order of 6% uh, 6 increase in capacity for humidity. And so uh, water vapor is in a warmer climate system, there's more water vapor available to these storms, whether they're hurricanes, 
rainstorms or even blizzards. And so that's counterintuitive to people that uh, climate warming could lead to um, more intense or snowier blizzards, for, for example. So when we learned about the water cycle in fourth grade or third grade, uh, we learned about precipitation, condensation, and infiltration, and soil uh, evapotranspiration, and so forth. Unfortunately, today, we need to teach this type of water cycle. Uh, this is a, a look at what happens as our climate system warms and how it affects water cycle, uh, increased rain events, and the heaviest precipitation events. There's certainly literature that shows us that the top 1% to 2% rain intensities are much more intense than they were in the 1950s. So in other words, uh, when we get heavy precipitation events, the intensity is much greater than they would have been 40 or 50 years ago. The problem with that is uh, many of our, our stormwater management design and engineered systems in cities particularly are engineered under the assumption of stationarity. Uh, they're engineered for the 1960s and 70s rainstorms or snowstorms in that they assume that it would rain or snow the same way in 2021 that it does in 1970 or 1965, and that just doesn't happen. And so uh, here you can see many ways that our water cycle uh, is under stress because of climate change. That reveals itself not just in the wet extremes, but also in the dry extremes. Uh, the atmosphere is a fluid. Uh, uh, many atmospheric scientists and meteorologists in our curricula, we teach it in ours here at the University of Georgia, have to take so much fluid dynamics, uh, the same calculus and math that many of you likely took as well, because the atmosphere is just a fluid on a rotating body. And so we have these wave patterns of troughs and ridges in the atmosphere, these Rossby waves that we call them. And in the ridge or high amplitude part of those waves, we often see heat and drying conditions. And so this is a paper from last year, September, showing a century of observations reveals an increased likelihood of continental scale compound hot dry events. In other words, we're seeing sustained periods of heat and drying. And so that's a double whammy or a compound event. Uh, I know for example, Travis is coming to us from Alaska, and I, I mean, we've seen some anomaly heat events and wildfire events in that part of the country, is, and so in the western U.S. and Australia and so forth. So it's both sides of the ledger when we talk about extremes as they're coupled to climate change. And again, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, if you will, um, but again, I, as a climate scientist, this, I'm someone that gets questions from climate contrarian perspectives all of the time. And they'll say, well, you know, the solar forcing changes and it's the, the change in the energy from the sun or it's changes in albedo in the land or it's aerosols or it's clouds and you don't understand those things. Well, the reality is we do. This is a radiative forcing caused by human activity since 1750. And it's very clear to us as climate scientists that the greenhouse gas contributions to the radiative forcing are the most significant to the change. Yes, we get changes related to the energy from the sun. But yes, we get changes due to the variability in, of clouds and aerosols or pollutants. But as I tell my students sometimes at the University of Georgia, I ask them, I said, if we have an apple pie, what is the most important ingredient in that apple pie? And they'll raise their hand and they say, apples, of course. And I said, yes. I said, greenhouse gases are the apples of the climate apple pie. In other words, it's not the brown sugar, it's not the flour, uh, it, or if you will, it's not the sun, it's not the land use, it's the greenhouse gases. They are the key ingredient in this radiative forcing pie, if you follow my analogy. And so I think you all understand that. So how that relates to extreme events. Uh, if you look at this, this booklet here that I'm showing you, I was one of the authors of a National Academy of Science study back in 2016. A group of experts, 10 of us, were um, brought together to assess the state of our understanding of this new type of science called attribution science. Attribution is this idea that we try to understand what contributions climate change is having in today's weather events. That's what we talk about when we say attribution. Now that, that study is a free PDF download from uh, most university or public computers. Uh, so I invite you to kind of grab that, but I'll try to hit some of the high points of it today. Uh, we know that the observed frequency, intensity, and duration of some extreme weather events have been changing as the climate system warms. 
um, heat waves are one of the ones that we really have a, a, a finger on, extreme precipitation events, drought, and so forth. So I'll talk a little bit about that today. And in fact, it, right before the world shut down because of the pandemic, uh, I was asked to testify before the House Science Committee on Congress. And here I am with four of my colleagues, and one of the first things that I told them in that testimony is that the, the extremes are becoming more extreme, and that's what people feel. People aren't going to notice the 1.5 or 2 degrees C warming. And by the way, I just wrote an article in Forbes that published it just this week talking about how we have to stop talking about, yes, we're behind the curve in the U.S. in using Celsius instead of uh, using Fahrenheit instead of, instead of Celsius. But every time you hear someone talk about the Paris Agreement, or COP26, the big meeting in Glasgow right now, you're hearing discussions about we've got to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Well, that's the lingo, but a lot of people in the United States don't think in Celsius, they think in Fahrenheit. So I argue that we need to talk about things in terms of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, because that's just what people in the United States understand. Uh, and then going forward, talk in Fahrenheit. But my point here being that 2.7 degree warming that we're trying to limit to, that's significant. If you ran a fever or your child ran a 2.7 degree Fahrenheit fever, that'd be over 101 degrees, right? That would cause the body problems, especially if it's sustained. 2.7 degrees of warming causes the climate system problems and we don't expect it to stop at 2.7. And that leads to changes in the extreme events. So let me use a cookie analogy. Um, because people tell me, again, I told you earlier, people come up to me and say, well, we get hurricanes naturally all of the time, uh, drought, floods, and so forth. So let's think of the cookie as an event. Let's think of the ingredients as the factors that can cause an event. And let's think of the baking surface and oven temperature as the conditions in which the event occurred. So yeah, we can tinker with the ingredients and get a different cookie if we change the amount of sugar or ref refrigerate the flour overnight or use all white sugar versus all brown sugar, we get a slightly different cookie. That's the same thing with the atmosphere. We get naturally varying systems and hurricanes and so forth. Uh, but when we turn up the oven's uh, baking surface or oven temperature, uh, we get a, a, a change cookie on top of the variability caused by the changes in the ingredients. And so I like to use this analogy uh, in the sense that, yes, we have naturally varying climate system, but we have this sort of amplified forcing uh, within that overall system, which is producing a different type of cookie, it's producing a different type of hurricane, it's producing a different type of drought. And so that's the notion of extreme event attribution relationships. And sort of the bottom line up front here of that report is we, we use something called the three legs of the stools approach. What I mean by that is we said, okay, here's the three criteria that we're gonna use to assess uh, extreme weather events in the context of climate change from an attribution standpoint. We have to have good physical understanding of the event. We have to be able to, what's the reproducibility of those events in today's climate models? and how long of an observational record do we have? So those three uh, factors came into play. And we evaluated the current literature and state of the science. And what we found is that it's the extreme heat and cold events that we have the highest confidence in the ability to attribute to climate change. In other words, today's heat waves and reduction in extreme cold events is we have high confidence that climate change is causing those. We also have fairly high confidence in the hydrological drought and heavy precipitation events and somewhat hurricanes as well. So in other words, with those events, we've got pretty good physical understanding of what should happen in a warmer climate system. We have pretty decent observations going back several decades and we can reproduce those events in the climate models. And so if you look at this graphic, that's why those events uh, sort of fall in this higher confidence and understanding category. Now, for example, if you look down here uh, at this black, it says severe convective storms. Those are basically tornadic storms. You notice that it's low. Our confidence in our ability to attribute tornadic storms to severe storms to climate change is low. That doesn't mean there aren't relationships. It just means where the state of the science and the peer-reviewed li literature is. 
is fairly low based on those three legs of the stools approach that I talked to you about. And so that was really the bottom line right up front. Now I wanna shift gears because I, I hopefully at least have established that uh, we have pretty good confidence that the DNA of climate change is in today's extreme weather events. This is a, the way I approach some of my research these days. Now I'm a, I'm a physical scientist, so I've done physical research on hydrometeorological systems, hurricanes, precipitation, and so forth. But some of my students in recent years have started to think about the implications of these extreme weather events on people and populations and society. And this is the framework that I use. I, I use this risk is equal to hazard time exposure times vulnerability divided by resilience. Now, hazard is the actual extreme weather event, the hurricane, the drought, the flood, the heat wave. Everyone is exposed to that event but there are certain people and infrastructures within our society that will have greater sensitivity or vulnerability to those events. And then there are people within society that have greater resilience. They, they can bounce back from the event. And so when we couple those all together, uh, we get this uh, risk index that we talk about in much of the research that my group has done over the past few years. So, at this point, I want to pause and uh, read a statement from the great Dr. Robert Bullard, who is considered by many to be the godfather of the environmental justice movement. He's a friend and mentor of mine. And, and Bob says, environmental justice embraces the principle that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. Here's the kicker. Today, zip code is still the most potent predictor of an individual's health and well-being. Individuals who physically live on the wrong side of the tracks are subjected to elevated environmental health threats and more than their fair share of preventable diseases. And so this is really the sort of statement of environmental justice. I think that we can take some of these same principles and convey them as climate justice too, because we know that certain people uh, certain income groups, marginalized, under um, uh, disproportionately re uh, represented groups in certain facets are more vulnerable to these extreme events and have less adaptive capacity or resilience to those events. Here is a paper that one of my students published back in 2015 on, I live in the state of Georgia. We did an assessment at county level of where people in the state are most vulnerable to climate change. Now we dug into the, the extreme weather climate events that happen in these counties, but then we also looked at sort of things like, well, how, how many people live there that have insurance? Uh, how many people are above the age of 65? How many African-American, Hispanic, uh, indigenous population? Who lives closest to the hospitals? These are all metrics of social vulnerability. And so uh, we did this sort of unique sort of analysis to understand what counties are most vulnerable. And there you see, well, one of the things that you see is that the entire state of Georgia on our climate vulnerability index has increased. So it went from a yellowish to an orangish. So the entire state has become more climate vulnerable. But then you can see these are the counties surrounding metropolitan Atlanta. This is Savannah and many of our coastal counties. Uh, you can see much of our southern agricultural and rural counties in the southern part of the state. There's high climate vulnerability for different reasons. In the coastal community, you have vulnerable populations and in inundation and flooding. In the urban areas of Atlanta and Augusta and Macon and, uh, and uh, Columbus and, and Augusta, you've got vulnerable populations exposed for disproportionately to heat and flooding. And so we decided to expand this analysis and because we know that these are the groups of people based on the National Climate Assessment Report that tend to be most vulnerable to climate change and extremes, communities of color, children, older adults, and low-income communities. So we know that. So we have decided to uh, expand our study to the year 2040. This is a paper we just published in Natural Hazards uh, back in 2020. Uh, this is, we use the climate models to project out the hazard risk going forward where we expect more heat waves, drought, floods, and so forth. Uh, again, I apologize to the folks in Alaska, but this is really focused on the contiguous or contaminated U.S. Uh, so this is the hazard. This is our metric of exposure. And then we were able to project out social vulnerability as well. And so you can see the counties that are most vulnerable just from a social perspective. 
And then when we combine those two together, this is our climate risk that we expect in the year 2040. Now, keep in mind, just because you see yellow, those aren't areas that are not vulnerable to climate change. They're just less vulnerable on this relative scale. Uh, you can see that the areas of at least the contiguous or continental U.S. that are most vulnerable are our coastal communities and the urban environments and the desert southwest and parts of the uh, Pacific Northwest as well. And so this gives us an idea of where we expect the greatest amount of climate vulnerability to be. It's not the play only place. Places in yellow will certainly feel the impact and brunt of climate change, but this is, again, a relative scale. So after Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, I want you to pay attention to this headline here. This is from 2016. 11 years after Hurricane Katrina, uh, white New Orleans has recovered from Hurricane Katrina, black New Orleans has not. And I've visited there recently. I can, I can confirm that with my own eyes. And it's simply related to the education wealth gap. Uh, the education wealth gap defines that adaptive capacity or that resiliency term in that risk equation. Um, you know, I, I, I fall into, even though I'm an African-American, I fall into an economic category where I have greater resilience or adaptive capacity. So if there's a Hurricane Katrina coming to uh, New Orleans and I happen to live there, I have the means to get my family and go to Memphis to stay in a hotel for a week. I have good insurance on my home, so I will be able to recover if my roof is damaged or my home is flooded. And that's the concept of resilience. We've seen the same thing in the poorest neighborhoods of Houston after Hurricane Harvey. This is a headline from the Houston Chronicle, I believe, showing that a year after Hurricane Harvey in 2017, the poorest neighborhood still hadn't, hadn't recovered. Uh, and so I talk about something called the weather climate gap, which is a disproportionate sensitivity to extreme weather climate events and a delay in the ability to bounce back. And it's not just related to African-American communities, any community that's vulnerable, uh, even poor white communities, Hispanic communities, elderly populations, all of these communities. Now, I'm just using the example of Black communities here in this graphic uh, because we know that Black communities are typically more urban dwellers and disproportionately exposed to urban heat islands on, uh, within a, a, a climate warm environment in general. And as I said, it all comes down to the, the racial wealth inequality gap. Here is a look at the median household wealth by race and, race and ethnicity from, the, in, from 1983 and projected out to the year 2024. Look at the significant gap between white, black, and Latino. And that gap clearly defines why we have an extreme weather and climate gap. Uh, it, it is a no-brainer in terms of why there is less resiliency or adaptive capacity. So for example, in Southern parts of, uh, of the United States, uh, a study by Neil Debbage and colleagues, Debbage is one of my former PhD students, has found that African-Americans are 44% more likely to live in flood zones. And in Charlotte, Greenville, Char Spartanburg, South Carolina, 80% more likely to reside in 500 year flood zones. So these are things that we know. And so that's why I argue that, you know, there, that we have to expand this idea of environmental justice to something we call climate justice. Okay. Now, I've talked to you about the extreme weather changes that are happening because of climate change. Then I talked about vulnerability and risk. I want to conclude the discussion with some thoughts on communication. Now, one of my colleagues, Susan Jasko at the University of Alabama, I was talking to her one time and I said, you know, after Hurricane Harvey, I heard all of these interviews where people were saying, you know, we didn't think it was going to be that bad. We get rainstorms all the time and flooding in Houston, Texas. Yes, you do, but Harvey was an anomaly event. There was 50 inches of rainfall in a five-day period of time. You haven't experienced that. So that they were exhibiting something called normalcy bias. Uh, they were sort of projecting what they normally experience on the Harvey, even though it was an anomaly event. So Susan says, uh, I think it's very difficult for people to truly imagine what they have not known. If you think about how many experiences one has in life, the people who had that experience tell you it's going to be like X, you, know, you nod your head and you're, yeah, right, whatever. But then when you go through and experience that event, you end up saying, oh, my gosh, wow, she told me it was going to be like this, but I didn't really understand. That's really a statement of people sort of being sort of bounded by normalcy bias. And this creates challenges when we're communicating climate change and the extreme risk associated with climate change. But there are other challenges too, the Dunning-Kruger effect. This idea, this Dunning-Kruger effect, the two Cornell 
psychology professors uh, established this Dunning-Kruger effect, which says that people think they un- know more than they do about topics and they underestimate what they don't know about those topics. And so I'm sure all of us <laughs> have experienced that in some fashion or form along the way. Uh, confirmation bias. Uh, we live in a society where people can consume information uh, from places there that already are sort of consistent with the, what they already think or believe. And then, of course, social media and all the misinformation it propagates on social media. And then, frankly, people's ideological marinades. I, I, I wrote a book last year on, on uh, called The Race Awakening of 2020, where I was just grappling with how to help society move forward in the wake of George Floyd. And I talked in that book about marinades, how we're all, we all grew up in certain cultural or religious or political marinades and just like vegetables or meat, the longer we soak in those marinades, we, we take on that flavor. And so I think those same marinades help make it very difficult along with these other things to communicate climate science. My approach, and I argue this with policymakers all the time is we've got to anchor climate change narratives in the kitchen table issues. You know, you know, polar bears are important, the butterflies, the year 2080, but people resonate with what is affecting their kitchen table issues right now. So for example, Hurricane Michael, when it moved through uh, Florida and into Georgia, this part of Georgia here that I'm highlighting with my cursor, this is one of the most agriculturally intense regions of our state. Uh, it leads the nation in production of peanuts and pecans. And, and certain bell pepper uh, uh, varieties of bell peppers and poultry. Three to four, it is 2.5 there, but really ended up being three to four billion dollars in economic losses here. And that drove up the, this is a big cotton area industry here too. That drove up the prices of everything from t-shirts to peanut butter. These are things that people understand. They were paying more for peanut butter or fruit of the loom. And so it's important for us to establish these kitchen table issues when we talk about climate change because there were impacts on significant industry that affect everyone. Here's another kitchen table issue. According to the National Climate Assessment Report, uh, as we get into those higher temperature regimes as climate changes, this is the net reduction in hours that, uh, that OSHA the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Administration will allow workers to uh, work in. They have these wet bulb temperature requirements that I mentioned earlier uh, in terms of safe working conditions outside. Well, look at the Southern and into the interior US at the reduction in work hours outside. Think about how many laborers work outside in construction industry, agricultural industry, and so forth. This has a direct impact on people's pocketbooks if they can't work longer hours uh, as, as our climate system wars. So that's what I mean by kitchen table issues. So, you know, and this is an article I wrote in Forbes magazine several years ago now. We have to use some strategies when communicating science to non-scientists. And so this is relevant to you all as astronomers as well. Uh, the, the, I, I, these tips are very much um, generic. Uh, I, I included this one little graphic because one of the biggest challenges we have in weather communication is people don't understand the difference between a tornado watch and a tornado warning. You'd be surprised at how often people get those confused. They'll say, well, I thought the tornado watch meant you were watching the tornado, so it's happening right there. In fact, it's not. So Brad Panovich, Panovich produced this little meme on Twitter. We have the ingredients for cupcakes here. So that's cupcake watch. We have a cupcake. That's cupcake warning. So hopefully this little uh, analogy helps us understand that a tornado watch or a hurricane watch means we have conditions right for that event, but it hasn't happened yet. Warning means it's actually happened. So, you know, that's really good science communication. So other tips that I wrote about in my Forbes article is we have to know our audience. You can't go to uh, the Rotary Club or a local church with the same talk that you would give uh, at the American Astronomical Society meeting or the American Meteorological Society meeting. I mean, you have to have a different approach because if you don't know your audience, it's like throwing darts at a dartboard with the lights off. We have to be very cognizant of the jargon that we use. I mean, in my field, and I'm sure in yours, we throw around things that are very meaningful to us, but in certain audiences, they have very little meaning or, at all. And in some cases, not only have very little meaning, means something completely different. I'll give you an example. In climate science, we often talk about that there's a 
positive trend in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So that means it's the, the, there's an increasing trend. But to many people in the public, the word positive is good. Hey, oh, that's good. It's a positive trend. That's good. So we have to be aware of these jargony type things that confuse the public. You know, if I said a thermometer has a bias, has a two degree warm bias, that means it's just offset. It's warm by two degrees every time we take a measurement. But to the public, the word bias has devious and, and even evil intent. There's a bias there. Ooh. So we have to be aware of these types of things. We have to get right to the point. We as scientists, as scholars, as professors, as graduate students, we are trained to uh, write a 200 word dissertation where we give all the background material, we give the methodology and the literature review and the data and so, and then and on page 250 of the dissertation, we tell you what we found. Or we go to a science conference, uh, we give a 40 minute talk, we give all the background, you know, 35 minutes later when a few people are back there in the audience nodding off, we tell you what we found. That's how we're trained as scientists. But when we're communicating to public and policymakers and stakeholders, you got to get the bottom line right up front. You have to invert the pyramid. You've got to give the, the get right to the point and then work backwards. But in science, we're taught to give all the information, the pyramids upside down, give all the information and work our way down to the point, you know, 200 pages later. Use analogies and metaphors. You know, one of the things that I get, and I'll start getting it here soon on Twitter. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Shepherd 2013, by the way, D R S H E P H E R D 2013. I'd love to have you as a follower. But we're getting into the cold season, and I'll have people say, Hey, Dr. Shepherd, it's snowing. It's 30 degrees outside. How can there be global warming? And I said, Well, you live in Boston and it's winter. That's why it's cold and snowing. So cold temperatures and snow will still be around even as our climate changes. And so I often say weather is your mood and, and climate is your personality because that day's weather tells you nothing about climate or climate change in the same way that your mood today tells me nothing about your personality. Try to use three points when conveying information to the public. Studies have shown that people still remember things in threes, uh, whether it's three reasons you did the research, three key findings that you found from the research, three ways that that research will benefit society, People remember things in threes. In addition to that, uh, keep those three points, miniature, meaningful, and memorable. I call those the three Ms, miniature, meaningful, and memorable. Now, those are things that I've picked up along the way. When you're talking in a public format, you are the expert. Uh, even if you're talking, I mean, I, 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 you all are the experts on various aspects of astronomy, but I mean, I, I know a little, I, relative to the public, I could probably go on CBS and talk about some aspects of astronomy and, and, and no more than the same that you probably could talk about aspects of climate change, even though you're astronomers. Um, use social media. We are behind the curve as academics and ivory tower scholars in this area. I still have colleagues that tell me, I don't use that new stuff like Twitter. I'm like, newsflash, it's not new. It's been around a while. And it's important to engage. It's important to, you know, that that when I told you I testified before the House Science Committee, a staffer from Edie Bernice Johnson, Congressman Johnson's office, followed me on Twitter. She said, I, I reached out to you because I just love the way you convey climate information. You know, we've got to be in those environments. We've got to engage. We've got to get beyond this idea that, oh, serious scholars don't talk to the media or testify before policymakers. We're in an era where we have to have end-to-end -end scientists. We just have to. Uh, otherwise, if we're not there, especially in the world of climate science, if people like me aren't engaging, there are people with agendas and deleterious uh, outcomes that are happy to fill the gap that I leave behind because I'm not willing to talk to CBS. So we have to engage. And so that means we also have to get rid of this myth of popularizers that, oh, uh, look, I mean, I if you follow me, and I, I know Travis is somewhat familiar with me, I'm very active in social media. I write for Forbes. I host a podcast and show on the Weather Channel called Weather Geeks. But I also lead my department every year in fund extramural funding and the number of peer reviewed papers published. So you can do both. It's not extra stuff. It's a part of our scholar. I firmly view public engagement as a part of our scholarship. Now, it's not that extra service stuff. And that's just how I see the world. And then we have to relate. We, we have to find ways to connect with people's value systems, particularly on climate change. I talk to groups of people that are skeptical all the time. And I don't go into those environments talking about trend lines and sensitivity analysis. I try to find a value system that I can connect to 
and develop that relationship and lessen mistrust. And then hopefully we can, we can work together. So that's really the approach. So as we come to a close here, how do we close this weather climate gap? Well, the obvious answer is we've got to reduce emissions. We've got to get the carbon emissions down. And that's what COP26 is currently trying to address. The Paris Agreement has been signed and tries to address that. But we know it's too late to just rely on mitigation or reduction in emissions. We have to adapt. We've got to increase adaptation strategies, ways to cope with what's happening and going to happen over the next 10 to 20 years. We also have to erode that income gap because that's the fundamental reason we have disparities in terms of who's most vulnerable to these extreme weather climate events. But when we do uh, institute mitigation, adaptations, and other policy strategies, we've got to make sure that it's not uh, for a select and advantaged few or on the backs of those marginalized groups. For example, in South Florida, um, there are people that are fleeing their million dollar condos on the coast because of the sea level rise, but they're moving inland to higher ground but unfortunately, they're displacing, um, you know, you know, marginalized groups that have lived in those communities forever. So you have this sort of uh, climate um, gentrification happening in places. Uh, I can imagine in places, you know, like Alaska, for example, there are indigenous and marginalized populations, and there may be policies that benefit some but harm them. So we have to be aware of these types of things as we move forward and make sure that they're not impacted at all by what's happening got to educate marginal populations about their vulnerabilities, and we have to increase climate literacy in the community level. Uh, we've got to make it simple and relevant to them. Those are key things that we have to do uh, to close the gap. And so with that, I hope that there was, I shared a good sense of some of the things that we're thinking about now in the world of climate science, but also societal impact and how to better communicate the message. So thank you for giving me an ear today. Thank you, Marshall. That was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time today to, to talk with us about your perspectives, not only on weather, but communication. And, and I, for one, am looking forward to the, uh, the cupcake warning. So that's pretty, pretty darn exciting. Um, so I'm really looking forward to our Q&A session with you. I know I have a lot of questions for you already, and I know our audience will as well. So thank you so much for taking the time to meet with us today. Thank you, Travis. We hope you've enjoyed today's talk. Each of our talks is followed with a Q&A session that you can learn more about in the video description. If you're interested in Astronomers for Planet Earth, you can learn more at our website, astronomersforplanet.earth, and on social media as well. If you would like to be notified about future talks and events, please follow and join us.